If you were to ask me what my favorite book series of all time is, I would have to say it's The Lord of the Rings. And there's a, a scene in The Lord of the Rings that's later depicted in the movie where the hobbits, Sam and Frodo, are being guided by Gollum towards Mordor to destroy the One Ring. And on their journey, they pass through a place that is known as the Dead Marshes. And as they're making their way through the Dead Marshes, they can see just evidence of death everywhere. And they ask Gollum what happened there. And he said that long ago, there was a great battle between elves and men and orcs. Right now, the place where I'm at has that similar feeling. There's evidence here of a battle that occurred long ago. Right now, I'm walking the battlefields of Verdun. This is a place where, in 1916, one of the most vicious battles of the Great War occurred. This battle is going to be like a vortex that would just pull men in and chew them up and spit them out. Three quarters of the French army would end up finding themselves fighting right here in Verdun. And by the time it was all over, there were between seven and 800,000 casualties in the middle of the battle. Both sides are wanting to call it quits, but yet Verdun keeps pulling them in and consuming their armies. The ground that we are walking is quite literally a graveyard as these barrages of artillery fire in the battle would turn the ground over several times. The earth literally consumed the dead where they had fallen. I don't know what hell on earth would actually look like, but if I had to guess, I would say it looks something like Verdun. Before we get into the opening phase of the battle, we probably need to ask ourselves, why Verdun? What, what was it about this place that led to it being the site of 300 days of just complete slaughter? Well, in 1870, after the Franco-Prussian War, France had lost the territories of Alsace and Lorraine, which put Verdun right on the new eastern border. Uh, obviously wanting to uh, prevent uh, another uh, loss like that from happening again, there was a series of fortifications that was built around the city of Verdun. Verdun lies kind of at a crossroads. Uh, it lies right on the Meuse River, so there's a north-south axis there. Uh, it also lies along an east-west axis that connects Paris to, uh, to the east. So, so this network of forts was built around Verdun uh, with a whole bunch of like smaller command posts and strong points built in between, much like the, the one that we see right here behind me. When the guns started booming in the opening phases of World War I in August of 1914, uh, Verdun really didn't catch the, the full brunt of the German attack. As a matter of fact, the, the lines kind of bent around Verdun and it formed a, a little bit of a salient in the line. Well, late in 1915, early in 1916, uh, the, the commander of German forces, uh, Erich von Falkenhayn, developed this plan that was gonna be called Operation Judgment. And Verdun was going to be the focal point of the German army's wrath. The idea was that he was going to send in the German Fifth Army under the command of Crown Prince Wilhelm III, who was the son of Kaiser Wilhelm II. He was gonna send them in to Verdun, which really was kind of a weak point in the French lines. They had 
essentially stripped down all of their forts. Uh, they, they viewed forts as a little bit of a, a liability uh, at, at this phase and had, I don't know, kind of fallen out of love with the idea of fortifications. So Falkenhayn is going to send in um, Crown Prince Wilhelm III with the Fifth Army. They're going to try and, and take Verdun, open a breach into the line, and then kind of roll it up from the east. What we are looking at are the smashed ruins of one of these forts around the city of Verdun, which is going to give a bit of foreshadowing as to the violence to come. Now, there, there's this idea out there that with Verdun, uh, this was an important symbolic city to the French, and that Falkenhayn's plan was to take advantage of that, to threaten it, and then draw the French in and, quote, bleed them white right here. Well, there's some recent scholarship that has really called that into question. The whole idea of drawing the French in and bleeding them white is based on something called the Christmas letter that Falkenhayn said that he wrote to Kaiser Wilhelm II uh, in late December of 1915. Uh, the problem is there's no evidence that the Christmas letter ever existed except in the post-war writings of Falkenhayn. Plus, if Verdun was this important symbolic city, I'm not saying it wasn't important to the French, but if it was this sacred place, why did they strip down all of the defenses of these forts? So it seems more likely that in Falkenhayn's post-war writings, he was trying to justify the fact that the Germans were unable to break through at Verdun. So it's easier to say that all along what his plan was was just to draw them in and, and just murder them with artillery and bleed them white. On February the 21st, Operation Judgment was going to kick off with one of the most violent artillery barrages that had yet been seen in the war. And bearing the brunt of that initial assault to, to the north of where we are right now was one of my favorite figures from World War I, a guy by the name of Emile Driant who was the leader of an elite group of French soldiers called the Chasseurs, or the Hunters. And uh, they were positioned in a place called the Bois de Cour. We're gonna head up there right now. I've moved up to the north where the Battle of Verdun kicked off. And the, the battle was going to cover a wide front. We're only going to really focus in on a small portion of that front and kind of a, a well-known action there in the opening stages of the battle. So this field right behind me was the, the front line in this area around the Bois de Cour. The 
The Battle of Verdun is going to kick off on February 21st of 1916, and uh, it was actually delayed a little bit due to rain, uh, which was bad for the Germans and good for the French because it allowed them to kind of do some last minute uh, preparations for this attack. But from here, it's, it's pretty easy to see where the front line was. So over on this side in this tree line, of course, we've got the, the German 5th Army, and specifically in this tree line would be the 87th Infantry Division. Now off to their right and behind them a little bit, uh, would be the 81st Infantry Division. Uh, after the initial bombardment, the 81st Infantry Division is going to be advancing across this field, and the 87th is going to be advancing right across here into the Bois de Cour, where Emile Driant and his, his French hunters, or the uh, chasseurs, uh, were waiting for them. Now, here along this front, the, the Germans were separated from the French in some places as far as 750 meters, and in some places the line was as close as 30 meters, uh, which is just mind-boggling to me. Now, on the 21st, the, the battle is going to kick off with a barrage from the Germans from their long-range artillery. They were primarily targeting like French headquarters and bridges in the area of Verdun. And at 7.15 a.m., their fire shifted and they started hammering these frontline positions in places like the Bois de Cour. I've read accounts from soldiers in World War I who talk about the artillery barrages. And in one in particular, uh, it, it talks about how soldiers watched as an entire forest just disappeared before their eyes under artillery fire. What does that even look like? And, and even worse, uh, what would it have been like to be on the receiving end of that and all around you, the forest is just being cut down by shell fragments and shrapnel from the artillery that is being poured on your position. Here in the Bois de Cour, uh, this was being defended by Emile Drian's 56th and 59th uh, chasseurs. Again, that translates to hunters. Uh, you can think of these guys as like the, the U.S. Army Rangers of the French Army in the First World War. So these were elite troops that were defending these woods against the German attack. Here in these woods, you can just see evidence of the battle all over the place. Um, again, this is the 56th and 59th battalions that were occupying these woods. And they started the day off with 1,300 officers and men. And these woods just got absolutely pulverized. So what we're looking at right here is the remnants of a trench that would have been occupied by these French soldiers. Um, there were about 40 German batteries and about 50 trench mortars that fired an estimated 80,000 rounds into these woods, uh, which is only like 1,300 by 800 meters. We're gonna jump down into this trench and uh, if we look up ahead here, it looks like this particular trench line might have sustained a direct hit from one of these heavy German artillery pieces. Uh, there was a survivor of the battle named Maurice Broussard. 
Uh, he was from the, the 56th Battalion. He said that out of every five riflemen, uh, two are buried alive in their shattered dugouts, two are wounded, and the fifth waits. Just can't imagine how awful it must have been here. The artillery barrage here would last all day long. And about four o'clock, the, the barrage lifted and German infantry units started infiltrating these woods. And they would be bringing with them a new terrifying weapon, uh, the flamethrower. And once they got into what was left of these woods, they were shocked to find that there were actually still people alive and uh, that they were putting up a defense of this front line. So they, in some places, the, the French even counterattacked. Uh, so the Germans withdrew, and the next morning on the 22nd, they opened up artillery and just started pounding this position again. We've moved back a little bit now to the rear area for the 56th and 59th battalions. And uh, we're going up to the headquarters of Emile Drion. Uh, now, I haven't talked about Drion too much yet. Uh, Drion had been in the military. As a matter of fact, he was in the Chasseurs uh, when, when he was in and uh, retired out of the military at age 50. And then when the war cranked up, he got back in. He had been in, in politics uh, in that 10 year interim. Uh, so anyway, when he joins back up, he becomes the, uh, the Colonel of the 56th and the 59th uh, Chasseurs and was here in the Verdun sector and was deeply critical of the fact that Verdun was being stripped of its defenses and its guns were being uh, basically just hauled off to other areas of the front. Uh, to, to be fair, the people have been critical about the decision to strip Verdun. At the beginning of the war, the fortresses around Liège had fallen quickly. So people thought that, you know, forts were out of date. But anyway, Drion uh, used some of his political channels to protest. They did an investigation here and did find that uh, Verdun was being stripped down a little bit too much. Uh, but it was too little too late. Now Drion, he's a guy who's going to take care of his men. And he's going to take action. So he contracted out and started building some fortifications himself. This is a warrior who is preparing for war. Uh, so anyway, we're going to take a look at the headquarters for Emile Drion. Hey, Colonel Drion, do you think that you've brushed in your bunker good enough? Holy smokes. Uh, looks as if a dead gum tree has fell on Drion's command bunker. So that's a little bit of a bummer. Uh, I'm not going to be able to show it quite like I hoped. Uh, looks like over here we can see a little bit though. Okay. So here is the command bunker for Emile Drion with a tree on it. And uh, of course, you know, Drion is on the front line, uh, wanted to be prepared, wanted to protect his men. And uh, this is one of the bunkers that gets built in this area. And it was going to be subjected to some insane artillery fire. As a matter of fact, right here, you can see where a big chunk of German heavy artillery took out a corner of the bunker. Uh, let's actually go up here. Let's just take a walk around this thing. Okay, so this direction is north. Uh, and this is where... Drion expected that the German attack would come from. 
So yeah, if we look right here, you can see where, like here's the, the front of the bunker, but it has this layer of earth that's been piled up to, uh, to help protect it from artillery fire. And uh, look at here, we've got a big shell crater right here in the front. And if we look out ahead, it's a little bit hard to see with that vegetation covering the ground, but, but there are shell craters all over this place. Uh, let's just move on around here. Man, it's really a shame about this tree. All right, but anyway, uh, coming around here, getting ready to walk through another shell crater. So I'm going to walk around it and uh, something over here just caught my eye. Holy smokes. That is a big old hole. Huh. And I'm going to be honest, I don't know if that's from a shell crater or if there was another structure that was here. But man, if that was one of the heavy German shells, that was uh, a big one. Uh, all right, anyway, let me go back out here. Uh, so you can also see evidence of trenches that were connecting the uh, command bunker to some of the support trenches. Of course, you wanted to try and get below ground uh, because it could be a little bit hazardous otherwise. But uh, I think we're going to grab a light and take a look inside this bunker. All right, let's uh, dive down in here and see what we've got inside of this command bunker. Oh, there's the tree that fell on the bunker. Huh. It's actually quite simple. There's not really a whole lot to it, which I guess we can't really expect there to be a whole lot to it. Um, you know, this was designed just for protection here on the front line, uh, which served its purpose. And, oh, take a look at this. So we looked at that spot on the corner outside where a German shell had struck the bunker. Well, here's what it looks like on the inside. You can see where part of the ceiling has kind of collapsed here. Man, I would hate to have been the guy who was standing right there when that happened. I very well could have killed a person, I guess, uh, just from the, the concussion, maybe. Man, at the very least, it'd make you pee down both legs. Golly, that is something else. All right. Well, yeah, again, not much to it, but uh, there's the inside of the command bunker. All right, we've moved back outside of the bunker now. And uh, one more thing that I wanted to point out, probably already noticed these, oh, I guess little sculptures or, or whatever, uh, outside of the bunker. Well, each one of these is basically like a, a monument to a battalion of the chasseurs. And if we look closely, the ones that stand out at the gateway with the French helmets on top are for the 59th Battalion and also the 56th Battalion. Obviously the, the men who fought here uh, in late February of 1916. When the battle broke out here, uh, it, it was no surprise to the French. They had intercepted some radio communications and I think had captured a few prisoners and knew that something big was coming. So on the morning of the 21st, uh, Driant, who may have had a, a premonition of what was to come, uh, got up and he took off his wedding ring and gave it to his secretary. And he said, if I am killed, uh, you will give this to Madame Driant. Rode his horse right up here to this position at about 
quarter till seven. And shortly after that, that big artillery barrage is going to kick off. The, the chasseurs are going to hold off the, the Germans that first day, but on the second day, uh, they get overwhelmed. Now there were a couple of different factors at play that led to the withdrawal of Driant. Uh, for one, uh, of course, they're, they're getting just pounded uh, from artillery fire and German infantry from the front, but also the Germans had worked their way around and had kind of got behind them with a piece of light artillery. So Driant and what was left of his men started to pull back and uh, maybe maybe they withdrew through this trench line right here. trench line that Driant was taking as he was falling back would have led him to this spot right here. This was the aid station that he had had constructed. Uh, again, knowing that a battle was coming and that there would be wounded, he wanted to make sure that they were taken care of. So as he's falling back, he stopped here at, at this aid station, uh, checked in on the men, made sure that they had what they needed, uh, and then continued to fall back. With the Germans pressing in on all sides, Driant had organized what was left of his men into three different groups to fall back. And after stopping at the regimental aid post, he left the Bois de Cour and with a few men was making his way in this direction right here. Uh, but unfortunately, he wouldn't make it far. As Driant and the few men who were with him were making their way across this field that had just been transformed by the artillery fire. They're going from shell hole to shell hole and there's smoke billowing about everywhere and there's just blasted tree stumps. Well, they made it approximately to this spot and one of the sergeants who was with him recalled hearing Driant cry out behind him. And I've seen a few different things that he said. One of them was that he said, uh, oh God, oh my God. And when he looked back, uh, Driant had been hit and was killed. And this stone marker here shows the approximate spot where Colonel Driant was killed. And it looks like, yeah, somebody has uh, left a shell fragment right here at this marker. But yeah, this is, uh, this is where Driant drew his final breath on the 22nd of February, 1916. I've walked just a short distance from the spot where Colonel Driant fell. And after the, the battle swept through here and, and the Germans occupied this area, they came across the body of Colonel Driant and gave him a proper burial. And uh, the, the spot where he was buried is just right up here. Well, here is the temporary grave site of Colonel Emile Drian. So his body is not here, and I'll, I'll get to that in just a second, but there's an interesting story that is attached to the death and burial of Drian by German soldiers. Uh, on the 16th of March of 1916, a uh, German woman by the name of Baroness Schroeder, uh, who lived in Wiesbaden, Germany, uh, wrote a letter of condolence to Drian's wife via a Swiss contact. And uh, in, in the letter she wrote, My son 
an artillery lieutenant who fought opposite your husband, tells me to write and reassure you that Monsieur Driant was buried with all due respect and care, and that his enemy comrades dug and decorated a fine grave for him. The grave will be looked after so that you will be able to visit when peace returns. So a pretty incredible story uh, that is is attached to uh, to this temporary grave site. Uh, but Emile Dreyant would end up being moved after the war. Uh, there is a final resting place that was prepared for him not too far from where his command post was. So we're going to go take a look at that. Well, right here is the final resting place of Colonel Emile Dreyant, one of the many French heroes of the Battle of Verdun. And if we move up here, you can see on the stone covering his grave, it says Colonel Dreyant, uh, Commandant of the 56th and 59th Battalions of the Chasseurs. Uh, this, they were in the 72nd Infantry Division. And if you look over here, uh, they have a memorial to the 56th and the 59th. You can see the, the hunting horn there, which was their symbol. And all around Colonel Driant, well, he is surrounded by the men who fell with him here during the first few days of the Battle of Verdun. And on each one of these stones of unknown soldiers it says died for France. At the beginning of the battle there were 1200 men that were serving with Driant going up against 10,000 Germans and at the end of two days of fighting here there were only 110 survivors left. But their fight and their resistance and their sacrifice uh, allowed time for the French to kind of reinforce this area and blunt the German attack. Well, that was just a little bit on the very first days of the Battle of Verdun and the very last days of one of France's greatest heroes, Colonel Emile Driant, who, along with so many other French soldiers that day, did so much in holding off the German advance and protecting the city of Verdun. But the battle was not done harvesting souls here. There would be 300 days of vicious combat that would occur in, in this area and in the areas surrounding the city of Verdun in one of the most vicious battles that this world has ever seen. <laughs> 